Okay. So last week we concluded our, I don't know, foray into invertebrate animals. Um, and so this week we are going to start talking about vertebrates, but just before we do that, we do have to talk about some invertebrate forms in our phylum. And what is our phylum? Chordata or chordates. And tell me something significant about our phylum. Somebody. We are deuterostomes, one of only three phyla that are deuterostomes, including what other phyla are in there with us? Echinodermata and hemichordata, right? It's all coming back. It's all coming back. Somebody tell me something else significant about our phylum. Yeah. Okay, at least for the, yes, yeah, very sophisticated central nervous system, regardless of whether you are a vertebrate or an invertebrate. Our phylum is also one of three segmented phyla, right? Along with Arthropoda and Annelida. Okay, so basically all of your major groups of bilaterians, Lophotrochozoan protostomes, there's a segmented phylum. Ectosozoan protostomes, there's a segmented phylum. Deuterostomes, there's a segmented phylum. Just one, but there is. All right. So here are the framing questions that we're going to deal with in chapter 29. I don't know if you notice or not, but there are nine. We don't typically have this many from a single chapter. Okay. An indication that uh, this chapter is going to be fun, right? We all love framing questions. We all love lots and lots of material, right? You're like, Dr. Engel, just give me as much as you feel like I can take, and I'm, 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 I'm going to eat it. I'm going to eat it all up, right? And so this is your chapter. This chapter is just for you. Now, it does cover, in many cases, the most familiar of all living forms because it covers vertebrates, and we are vertebrates, and we have a special affinity for things that are like us, right? I don't know if you know that or not, but we tend to, uh, we tend to enjoy things that we can connect with in some way, right? Like we all lament together the Dodgers losing the World Series last night, right? And so we can lament together, and in some ways it helps the healing. It helps the healing that we all need. All right, anyways, sorry. Let's deal with our first framing question. I'm sorry if I brought up something. I, I'm, I'm really sorry if I ruined it for you and you didn't even know, right? <laughs> All right, do all chordates really have the four hallmark features? We actually mentioned the four hallmark features on Friday. I don't know if you saw that or not, um, but we did. And the answer to this question is yes, at least at some point in development. But what is often common in animals is they will sometimes lose features if they take on a very simple lifestyle. Right? And if they take on a lifestyle that does not require a very efficient design and a very uh, capable of directed movement, oftentimes they'll lose some of the features associated with that. Now, chordates come in three varieties, in, in three what we call subphyla. So the phylum is chordata, and then underneath that there are three subphyla. The first, urochordata, or the urochordates, also known as tunicates, sometimes as sea squirts, although there are some uh, animals in this subphylum that would not fit that category. So these go through a very complex metamorphosis. The larvae very clearly have our four hallmark chordate characteristics, which again, if you don't remember from Friday, are the notochord, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, but it's, it's a skeletal rod. Now, in, in most of your vertebrates, it gets replaced with the vertebral column, but at even early on in development in vertebrates, you have a notochord, a skeletal rod, uh, a post-anal tail, exactly what it sounds like, a tail that extends beyond the anus, right? Wonderful when the name makes sense. Um, a dorsal hollow nerve cord, and uh, so this is, is very unusual for animals. First of all, not many animals have a very complex and well-designed nervous system. 
vertebrates and, and all chordates do. And the animals that do, their major nerve cord runs along the ventral surface, the part that faces down. In chordates, it runs along the dorsal surface, which is unique. It's unique to this phylum. And then the, the other one are pharyngeal slits. Those are not lost in the urochordates. They retain those, although many of our other... Um, Many of our other chordate groups actually do lose those. Here's something that's interesting about this. So again, this is unique for this phylum. Other phyla that have complex nervous systems, the major nerve cord runs along the ventral surface. So there's a Hox gene, and somebody remind me what a Hox gene is. Master, Master control gene. So there's a Hox gene that determines the dorsal ventral axis that determines which way is ventral, which way is dorsal. There's a Hox gene to establish that axis. That Hox gene is the gene, the sequence of that gene is backwards in chordates compared to all other animals. Which means that this major nerve cord runs along the same surface in all animals, it's just chordates the ventral surface is flipped and is actually the dorsal surface. It's kind of interesting. I don't know what to do with that. I don't know what you should do with that other than know it. Yeah, Micah. Would that um, play into the development of prostomy or the mouth? Um, po possibly, but probably not because echinoderms, they still have the right establishment of the dorsal ventral surface. And for, what's interesting is in many ways, vertebrates develop like protostomes do, other than the mouth forming from the second opening into the gut, other than having radial versus spiral cleavage, and other than having indeterminate versus determinate. In, in all other ways, they develop like protostomes. And I say they, well, I really mean we, because we are vertebrates, but you know, other vertebrates as well. All right, so those are the urochordates. Again, they go through a complex metamorphosis and they lose three of the four hallmark features. They lose the postanal tail, they lose the dorsal hollow nerve cord, and they lose the skeletal rod. And that is an indication that what is happening as they go from larvae to adult, are they becoming more active or less active? How do you know? It's, it's, yeah, it's true, but how do we know, Amanda? Yes, yeah, so they're losing the, what, what allows them to have a very complex nervous system. It's kind of going to be hard to maintain an active lifestyle with a very simple nervous system, right? That make sense? They're also losing the major locomotion structure. Unless, I mean, like, we don't have a post-anal tail and we still get around just fine. Um, but these are, these are tunicates, also known as sea squirts. These are aquatic <laughs> organisms. Moving around in that without a tail is challenging. It's not impossible, because you're like, lots of things move around in the ocean without tails. Right? Look at crabs. They do a wonderful job. They don't have any tails. I know, I get it. Uh, and then notochord, they lose their major skeletal rod. Okay? So when you see a picture of a urochordate, you should anticipate seeing something that does not look like it is living a very active lifestyle. So it's probably anchored down to something and just rocking life as a filter feeder. Right? Okay, next group, next subphylum, cephalochordata, or the cephalochordates, also known as the lancelets. These are filter feeders, but they still maintain all four features. You're like filter feeding, you just kind of sit put and have water flow through your structures, right? Why would you maintain these four characteristics uh, if you're just going to filter feed? probably causes you to wonder, maybe they do something in addition to filter feeding. We'll see that in just a minute. <sighs> this is good stuff. Mm. The last subphylum, craniata, or the craniates, this includes us, uh, usually do not retain the notochord, and I already mentioned that, in most vertebrates, which make up most of the craniates, it's replaced with a vertebral column, including in us. We do not retain the notochord, although early in development we have it, a very early skeletal rod. 
Uh, most of them also do not maintain the pharyngeal slits, but instead those pharyngeal slits develop into connective tissues or sensory structures associated with the pharynx. Now, some argue, I think quite effectively, that there is a fifth hallmark chordate characteristic called the endostyle or thyroid gland. And so uh, what this is, is a structure that's involved in the metabolism of iodine. In filter feeders, the endostyle metabolizes iodine in order to create like a mucus to trap organic material which is what every filter feeder needs to do, right? You've got to be able to trap the material floating around in the water in order to filter it out, right? And then the thyroid gland, uh, again, associated with the metabolism of iodine, but now in terms of regulating growth and development in more sophisticated forms. And what's interesting is there's one craniate that has a filter feeding larva and an active adult and as a larva, it has an endostyle. And then as an adult, it has a thyroid gland. Mm. Yeah. Why don't we include it? I don't know. It depends on which list you look at. Um, because I, I, I would imagine that there's, uh, there's some discomfort with giving a fifth hallmark characteristic that comes in two forms. You're like, here's a fifth characteristic. It's one of these two things. It's, it's not a fifth characteristic then. It's like a fifth and a sixth, and some of them don't have one of them, right? I imagine there's some discomfort there, and then also maybe some uncertainty as whether or not you actually find it in all of your groups. All right. Okay. So here is a phylogeny, and, and it doesn't look great on here, but here's the place where you can find it in your text, uh, figure 29.2. And as you look at this, what do you notice that is absent? There are no polytomies, which we saw this before when we looked at a phylogeny of plants, and it's an indication of what? If you don't have a polytomy, what does that indicate? Not necessarily certainty, but a lot more comfort as to how we fit all of these groups of organisms together. All right? So which means that we have an idea of what these ancestors would look like. Doesn't mean they exist or they ever existed. It just means we have an idea on if they existed, this is what they would look like. They would look probably more like this group than they do this group that, you know, has a great deal more diversity, all right? So the, the, the craniate story, uh, this is for all deuterostomes, the deuterostome story is a little bit less confusing than trying to root all animals back to a single ancestor. But that should make sense because this actually only includes two of the three phyla that are part of deuterostomia. Okay. Now, I will tell you, if you start adding in all deuterostomes, this picture isn't nearly as neat. Okay. The story starts to get a little bit more confusing, but we do have an idea of what these ancestors would look like, and the chapter in the textbook talks a lot about these proposed ancestors at almost every step along the way. And what's really interesting is there are certain places like here where not only do we have an idea of what that ancestor would look like, we had an idea of when it would have had to have existed, and then people went looking in rocks that were thought to be that old and found something that looks like what they had proposed it would look like and was found exactly when they thought it would exist. Anyways, we'll get there. We'll talk about that. So here are your four hallmark chordate characteristics. Pharyngeal slits, okay, and again, most of your craniates lose those pharyngeal slits. They do not maintain them. Uh, and fishes, you're like, what about fishes? They've got these pharyngeal slits. No, they still, they, they don't retain these pharyngeal slits. They develop into gills, okay? Uh, the notochord, the skeletal rod, 
uh, dorsal hollow nerve cord, and a post anal tail. Now, what makes a good skeletal rod? If you're going to think about something that's going to function really well to be a, a nice skeletal feature, what should it have? What should be true of this feature? Okay, it should be flexible, right? Because if it's not flexible and you've got this major skeletal structure that spans the length of the animal and there's no flexibility there, you've got an issue, right? I, I would imagine that you have an issue. Any of you know that anybody that's had a spinal fusion, you can talk to them about flexibility, right? And you can see the issues there when you start losing flexibility in the skeletal feature, okay? What other features are good about it? So flexibility, yeah. Needs to be strong, right? Because this is going to be a site of muscle attachment. If you've got this major skeletal feature, it becomes a wonderful place to attach skeletal muscles for other features to move on. But it should be strong enough that it does it, it's flexible, but it also remains in place to allow the other parts of your body to move around, right? I don't know why I was doing, I mean, I was trying to illustrate, you know, body parts moving. <laughs> You're welcome. What else? So it should be strong, but also flexible. Another big one is, is not non-compressible. I think incompressible, is that a word? It can't be compressed, okay? And you're like, how is that different from strong? Well, strong gives this idea of like, it's rigid, right? It's flexible, but at the same time, it's rigid. But incompressible, you can't compress this thing down, okay? So, which means you can, you can flex the body back and forth, but as you do, it's not going to shrink the body down, okay? And so, it, in, in many ways, is a combination of both those features, flexibility, we're at the same time being strong. So, here's a, oh, let me ask you this. Which subphylum is this of craniata? All right, not of craniata, sorry, of chordata. That's one of the subphylum. It's not the answer. Like, you just gave us the answer. I did not. But I narrowed it down to the two others. Which subphylum is this? Eurochordata. How do you know? We've got one part of the life cycle illustrated, and we're pointing out the hallmark characteristics. And then we have something else pointed out, and it does not have all of the chordate the hallmark characteristics in fact it only has one the pharyngeal slits it's lost the uh, notochord it's lost the dorsal hollow nerve cord and it's lost the post anal tail and the subphylum that fits that category or those characteristics are the urochordates urochordata right and so here's where it would anchor down and then it filter feeds mm. okay Next, subphylum, cephalochordata. And so again, this is a filter feeder, but it also burrows down into the sediment. And so sometimes you could find areas with hundreds or even thousands of these lancelets, and they almost look like weird blades of grass as they protrude from the soil just enough to filter feed, but then they'll retract into it uh, when they think they may be in danger. And so they're, they're not anchored to some hard substance instead they burrow and that requires incredible strength and flexibility and so they do not lose the hallmark characteristics associated with strength and flexibility the notochord the post anal tail and the dorsal hollow nerve cord so they maintain those even though they are filter feeders all right okay select your break time what i want you to do is this uh, I want you to, so here's the question, but I don't want you to look at what's written on this slide, okay, other than this question. And I want you to take a couple of minutes working with those around you, and I want you to come up with an answer to this question. If we were going to truly root all of the species in chordata down to a single chordate ancestor that then diversified into all the different forms, okay? So if we were going to do that, Okay, including all vertebrates, all of the urochordates, all of the cephalochordates. We're going to root them all back to a single ancestor. Okay, which structure would have evolved first? The cranium okay, or the vertebral column? 
All right, take a couple of minutes, talk through this, come up with some ideas, and uh, we'll talk through this together. All right, two minutes, starting now. No, no, Corey, it's not, it's not, it's not made of bone. It is a skeletal rod, but it is not made of bone. Okay. It's, it's basically, it's a, um, it's a thick layer of connective tissue, almost like the type you would find forming ligaments and tendons, like really dense connective tissue, but it's hollow and then it's full of fluid. And so because it's full of fluid, which fluid, uh, liquid has a constant volume, it can't be compressed, but it can be bent around. Um, yes, unless it gets replaced by a vertebral column, which vertebral columns can be made of either bone or cartilage, right? So sharks have a vertebral column, but it is not made of bone. It's made of cartilage. And then lamprey as well. And lamprey, by the way, they're the group of craniates that have filter feeding larvae and then more active adults. And so the larvae have an endostyle and then the adults have a thyroid gland. And they also have big blocks of cartilage forming the vertebral column. So then the, the dorsal hollow nerve cord, is that what? How does that? Because I'm looking at, sorry, we're looking at a picture of the, uh, the lance that right here sticking yep. in the ground. How does that? So it's wrapped, I mean, it's basically nervous tissue forming a, a, around a, a hollow core. So the core is full of fluid. The outside are are nerves, okay, nerve so bundles, which are bundles of neurons. It's wrapped around the nodal No, but it's near it. It okay. forms near it. It's not wrapped around it. All right. What are our, our thoughts? Sorry, it, it ended up being three minutes and 17 seconds because people up here were asking me questions. All right. I actually, it's my own fault because I went to go grab water and I was gone for a minute and 23 seconds that I could have been using to answer the questions. All right, so what are our thoughts? Yeah, Emily. I think the cranium would kind of develop first because as organism evolved or whatever, they got into bigger kind of things. And so if you get bigger, you need to, like, uh, control the whole organism to mitigate. OK. OK, so but if, when you're starting small, the notochord will suffice. Is that the idea there? Because the notochord's, the notochord's present in, in ideally, or, or not ideally, but in uh, presumably your first chordate, right? Your chordate ancestor, because that's a feature found in all chordates, at least at some point in development, is the notochord. So you've already got a skeletal rod. And if you have a small size, is your idea that that will suffice but you need a cranium to protect the brain. And then as you grow larger, then you'll have need to develop something with a little bit more strength than the notochord. Yeah. Okay. Emerson. So I looked at the other view. Okay. And we thought that they still, well, almost all, all of them have a vertebral column. But yes. all of them have the cranium. So well, all of them have a notochord. Not all of them have a vertebral column. Brain. 
Well, he. So we thought that maybe it was maybe that's what it, like that happened later on. Okay. So some of them could have had that, whereas the the vertebral column could have just. Yeah. This is fun. Because all, I mean, yeah, well, first it's all speculation, right? Because no matter what your view of origins is, like, we can't, we can't recreate this process, right? We, we have some clues uh, from both the creation and from the creator, right? We have some clues and some ideas, uh, but we can't, we can't recreate this, right? We can't, we can't make this happen again. Yeah, Russell. saying most likely the ancestor would have had to have the nerve cord mm -hmm. uh, and it would be it would make much more sense at least to me if the nerve cord had adapted to that vertebral, vertebral column um, somehow so yeah the yeah you know it's it's interesting so uh your answer to this question is undoubtedly going to be influenced by what you know Right. And so the probably the first time you ever talked about animals in an academic way, I don't even remember what grade it happens, maybe kindergarten. I don't know, maybe afterwards. Right. You've got two groups of animals. Right. The first time you talk about animals in an academic way, you're like, we've got vertebrates and invertebrates and that's it. Right. That's your whole understanding of how to organize animals in a in like a, any kind of meaningful way. You're like, wow, it's amazing. I never thought about this before, but it makes so much sense. And, it, and it's, it's a great way to organize animals. It is a simplistic way, um, but that's undoubtedly going to influence this idea because you're like, okay, well, now something unique can happen, right? We've got something that's unique enough that we can classify it as a vertebrate. You know what's interesting, though? There are about 50,000 living vertebrate species. 50,000. There are nearly 2 million described animal species. 50,000 of them are vertebrates. So that's the overwhelming majority of animals are invertebrates. And so you're like, wow, that's, I, it was such a wonderful way to organize animals. But it's basically like, let's take this small percentage. And I don't know what percentage of 2,050,000 is because it's Monday and math is difficult on Mondays. Um, but, I mean, it's not that large of a percentage. Let's see, 100,000 would be 1 in 20, which would be 5%. So... 50,000, is that 2.5%-ish? Yeah, so 2.5%. So 97.5% of all animals are put in one of our two categories. Like, wow, these are interesting categories. Yeah. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yes. I, I mean, as far as like what it was capable of doing as far as in as far as receiving signals and sending signals, that's going to be limited without having some major conduit by which those signals move. But certainly so. I mean, you get uh, what are called diffuse nervous systems in some animals where signals just kind of move in all directions. Uh, and some of those animals have something of a of a centralized um processing center and so uh, flatworms are are an example of that with like a diffuse nervous system they don't have like yeah but they also have just a weird they still have networks of nerves that radiate out but they're not one centralized location it's it's called an orthogonous and it's almost shaped like a ladder where you have two major nerves and then you have horizontal nerves that flow all the way down the body it's weird Levi. Okay. Well, the cranium isn't the brain, right? The cranium is just some skeletal structure to to protect the brain. But you, you're, so you're thinking, I could. You certainly do, yeah. Yeah, and the interesting, the, the key aspect there is something that, that, Emily, you pointed out, that there's a skeletal rod without the vertebral column, right? There's still some major skeletal feature 
to provide that need or fill that need, right? Provide for that need is, is probably a better way to say it. Um, but there's no, there's no skeletal structure to protect the central processing center without the cranium, right? You already, you already have a skeletal rod. And so something to uh, remind you of is uh, that core data, core data includes both vertebrates and invertebrates. And so we can, we can classify them as a vertebrate or an invertebrate based on the presence or the absence of the vertebral column. Now, we have this one group, the hagfish, bless you, the hagfish, uh, which if you ever have an opportunity to eat hagfish, it's a horrible experience. <laughs> But you can have that opportunity just to say you've eaten something from every group of vertebrates, right? Nobody has that desire? Okay, sorry. Um, if you do, I mean, you can have that experience. These were traditionally grouped with the vertebrates. However, they retain the notochord. They never develop a vertebral column. So they've always been grouped as a vertebrate, but they don't have a vertebral column. So it actually forced us to rename the third subphylum. So the three subphyla used to be Eurochordata, Cephalochordata, and Vertebrata, or Vertebrata. But we have a group in there, the hagfish, that do not have a vertebral column. Instead, they retain the notochord. They do have a cranium. So they have a cranium to protect the brain, the central processing center, but they retain the notochord. And so then you've now we've renamed this called craniata and then use vertebrates to only refer to all craniates that aren't hagfish. So if all of these groups were to root back to a single ancestor, it would seem that the cranium would evolve before the vertebral column. We have some interesting, um, we have some in interesting issues here. We have this question here: Is the jaw part of the cranium or not? Because then we have a craniate and a vertebrate, the lamprey, which the lampreys. These are just fascinating animals. They are the group. Do you remember I told you there's a group of craniates that the larvae are filter feeding and contain an endostyle. And then the adults live a more active lifestyle and has a thyroid gland. Do you remember I said that? It was like 17 minutes ago. Those are the lamprey. And then lamprey, they actually, they live as larvae oftentimes in the ocean and then as adults in fresh water. It's like the reverse of what a lot of fishes do where they live as young in fresh water and then as adults out in the ocean, right? And then they have to migrate back to fresh water to spawn so that their larvae and their young can live in fret, right? You know, like salmon and sturgeon. I, man, do you, do, you, do you, have you ever eaten salmon? Okay. You should know where what you eat comes from. Just kind of maybe a rule to live by, I don't know. Might be something to know kind of where your food comes from. Anyways, and so these lamprey are just really interesting animals and they are craniates. They are vertebrates, but they are jawless. And so then you have a question of, can you actually have a cranium without a jaw? And so is this messed up even more? And then so we have this question, and if the notochord is a structural and skeletal rod, why would it need to be replaced by vertebrae? What is it about vertebrae that are better than a notochord? Any ideas here? What's that? Stronger. Seems to be that maybe there's additional strength there. So really to answer this question, you need to know a little bit more about the notochord, right? Yeah. Like Dr. Ringo, you just told us about a notochord like 17 minutes ago, and you didn't even tell us how you make it. So the notochord is essentially, it is a layer of connective tissue, really dense connective tissue, like what form ligaments and tendons. You, do you know what a, a tendon is? So you know like when you're eating a turkey leg and there's like all of this really hard material in the way of you getting all this muscle off of it? It's because they've just got massive tendons. The chicken legs, their tendons are small. Sometimes you eat them, you don't even know you ate the tendon because it's small and not really 
um, you know, hard to get around. But that turkey leg, man, those tendons are hard to get around. So you got to, like, pick pieces of meat off of it. You know what I'm talking about? You ever walked around, like, a Renaissance fair with a turkey leg just <laughs> getting after it? I, I, I don't know what to do with that. I was going to say you should have that experience, but I don't think that that's true. I don't, anyways. Um, so it, it's, it's a really dense connective tissue forming a hollow structure that then's full of fluid. Okay, that's the way most notochords are. Some notochords are completely solid with connective tissue, but a lot of them, they've got a, a outer connective tissue and then it's full of fluid. And so, yeah, there, there's probably something to that, that there's some added strength. Levi, did you have something? Um, well, I was going to guess maybe you better. Yeah. So you actually get, with a vertebral column, you have greater flexibility because you can flex just a portion of it and you have better strength. So with a vertebral column, you get a structure that is both stronger and more flexible. And this is really not a nice thing to do in engineering because you have a trade-off always. No matter what you make, there's always a trade-off between strength and flexibility. There's always a trade-off, right? Between strength and flexibility. You can't get around that. You take an anatomy class, you see at every joint that you have in your body, there is a trade-off between strength and flexibility, right? You build, you, I don't know, a catapult, you know? Cause you're like, man, I would just want to launch flaming gummy bears into, you know, my sibling's room. <laughs> <laughs> just me anyways and so you realize no matter what you design there's always a trade-off between strength and flexibility unless you use a completely novel design and that's what the vertebral column gives you so you if you, all you have is a notochord and you want to make some modifications to that notochord you are either if you want to make some modifications to make it stronger you are going to sacrifice flexibility if you want to make some modifications to make it more flexible you're going to sacrifice strength unless you use a completely different design. And then you can get something that's better in both uh, spaces, both flex more flexible and better designed. So here's a, uh, a wonderful picture of a cranium with the jaw. And so there you have a question, can you even have a true cranium without the jaw? I don't know how to answer that question. So I wrote it, but I don't, I don't really know what the best way to answer that. And so here's a typical, I don't know if you want to call this a typical, uh, a typical verte uh, vertebrate skeleton, although it, it ought to be typical because of the about 50,000 living vertebrate species, 28,000 of them are fish. Now of all of the fossil, so that's about 50%, maybe 55% uh, of all the fossil vertebrates, it's even more dramatically in favor of fish. So this is a typical uh, vertebrate skeleton. You can see bony uh, vertebral uh, or bony vertebrae forming a vertebral column. And when you see that, you can almost be certain that the notochord dissolves after you develop the vertebral column. Although there are some fishes that have both. They've got a vertebral column and a persistent notochord. And I don't know why, because the notochord is no longer functional if you've got a vertebral column, and it just seems selfish. Yeah. So, uh, for which came first, the cranium or the vertebral column, could we make an argument both ways, or is it specifically like uh, I think the best argument to be made, if you're going to root all craniates back to a single ancestor, or all chordates back to a single ancestor, is that the cranium came first. Okay. But if your view of origins does not allow that as an explanation, which mine does not, then they, they, they came simultaneously, right? And just some forms only have a cranium and lack a vertebral column. Many forms have both. Hagfish are cool. You're like, what are those hagfish doing with a cranium and no vertebral column? Hagfish are scavengers. And so when a whale dies, it floats for a little bit which is, was convenient for the whalers. When they would harpoon a whale, it would float for a while, and then so they can go and just kind of pull it on board. But then it sinks, and when it sinks down into the bottom of the ocean, it just sits there unless you're going to have scavengers that will come and recycle that organic material, right? And here come the hagfish, 
and they come by the hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands sometimes and just swarm these whale carcasses. So if you want to find something about hagfish, you can look up hagfish scavenging a whale carcass, and it, I mean, it'll, it'll just make you feel warm inside. You know? It's like, man, I only had this kind of feeling before when I would spend holidays with my family, and now I'm having this feeling all over again. It just feels right. Yeah, David. So are the notochords only in small organisms? Well, so hagfish are not, I mean, they're, they're not huge, but they're not, they're much, much bigger than like a cephalochordate, and they're larger than many vertebrate fish, fish with vertebrae. Um, so, but, and they're super flexible. Like they can tie their entire body in a knot. It's, it's really cool. It helps them to actually build up the force necessary to rip pieces of flesh off of the whale carcass. It also makes it hard for them to eat because they'll tie themselves in a knot and shoot out a bunch of mucus when something tries to eat them. And then so it's like you choke on something at the same time that it's slipping its way back out of your throat. It's wonderful. But when you eat them, they're not doing that anymore, you know. All right. What does it taste like? I Not good. I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. All right. Why are nathostomes favored? Well, this is a fun word. What on earth is a nathostome? Any of you know what the root stone means? 100% of you should know what the root stone means because we have protostome and we have deuterostome, right? So the stone means mouth, right? Okay, so now, do any of you know what the root stone means? Yeah. It means mouth, right? Oh, man, look at that. Okay, natho means jawed. So these are jawed mouthed animals, okay? So these are vertebrates that include a jaw. What's interesting is so we have two groups of living craniates that lack jaws, hagfish and lamprey. Combined, there's like 20 to 30 total species of 50,000 species, okay? Very small percentage of craniates, vertebrates lack jaws, right? 30 out of 50,000. I don't, again, I did, I did math earlier and I think it was right, but I don't want to do that math, okay? I think it's 0.05%. I don't know, okay? It's a very small percentage. When you talk about fossil forms, it's even more dramatic that your craniates and vertebrates are entirely jawed. So most of these uh, are jawed. However, there are some that are jawless. There are several species uh, living sp living groups, the hagfish and the lamprey. Hagfish are in class Mixini. That was on a previous slide. Lamprey, class Petromyzontidae. That's actually a family. Petromyzontida is the class. These are the only living jawless craniates. About 20 species of hagfish. 40 species of lamprey. So it's 60 total species, not 30. And then here we have one major jawless extinct group, the Ostracoderms. And so the rest of these are all jawed vertebrates. The rest of our vertebrates are all jawed. And so what I want you to do, we're going to do another lecture break. And I want you to take two minutes and I want you to answer this question. What is it about a jawed structure that make you better equipped to diversify uh, with whatever your design is. So regardless of what your view of origins is, uh, it seems to be that these groups of organisms are capable of diversifying. Okay. And so what is it about having a jaw in your design that makes your design especially efficient and especially equipped to diversify and end up you know, producing a number of different species. Another way of asking this question, what's so ha nice about having a jaw? All right. All right, take two minutes, starting now.
What's so good about having a job? So look at this. As far as jawless craniates go, we've only got two groups, two living groups, where we can study their ecology, we know what they can eat and what they can't eat. We've got the hagfishes that are scavengers. We saw this with like the saprobic fungi. When you are eating something that is dead and just sitting there, you can simplify your design quite a bit, right? The lampreys, these are filter feeders as larvae, and they're either parasitic as adults, or they only live long enough as adults to reproduce, and so they don't feed. Either way, it's a very simple feeding strategy, right? You either latch onto something and, you know, suck its blood, or you just don't feed at all, right? Either way, a very simple feeding strategy. So the theme here is what? Eating, right? If you want to have a very complicated feeding strategy, what do you need? Seems like you need a jaw. And so nathostomes, they've got this hinge structure in their cranium for allowing them to grasp something that is trying to get away. A dead whale does not try to get away from the hagfish, okay? as much as it would want to. Okay? It does not try to get away from the hagfish. The fish that are being parasitized by the lamprey they can't really swim away from something that's attached to your body. And so uh, trying to grab something that's trying to get away from you requires something more sophisticated. And so we've got an extinct group of jawed fishes known as the placoderms that are also heavily armored like the ostracoderms are, uh, but they had jaws. And then we've got our living groups of jawed craniates. Uh, Chondrichthians, sharks, skates, rays. So you have a cartilaginous skeleton. Usually have internal fertilization. <clears throat> they have placoid scales, which are basically chemically and structurally identical to the teeth. Just aren't in the mouth. And then, oh, Ampuli of Lorenzini. Those are fun things. We'll talk about those more later. Ampuli of Lorenzini. And then we've got our osteichthys, our bony fish. And so these come in two varieties. The actinopterygians, again, we'll talk more about these later. The ray finned fishes, and then the sarcopterygians. Sarcopterygii, the fleshy finned fishes. Okay, and so all of this to say, if you're going to have a sophisticated feeding strategy, you're probably going to require a jaw, if you're a vertebrate. Yeah. The part of the feed is they use less energy, because previously you were using whole body of Sure. That's going to be especially true for ambush predators. Yeah. They have more energy to use in different places. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right. We'll talk again. We'll talk about all these groups during this week. We'll talk about chondrichthians. We'll talk about osteichthians. Talk about actinopterygians, sarcopterygians. <laughs> oh man, these are great names. Great names. All right. So here are hagfish. Is rocking life in that little cave waiting for something to die for them to go and scavenge. They're beautiful, beautiful creatures. Here are lamprey. Not this. This is not a lamprey. That's some kind of a trout, probably a brown trout, lake trout. And then here are two lamprey sucking its blood. Yeah. Uh, to, to ward off predators. So a lot of predators will take advantage of dead animals and they'll scavenge as well, even though they're predatory. And um, if they happen to cross some hagfish and accidentally consume it or purposely consume it, the slime is meant to make that difficult. Yeah. Here's a placoderm, very heavily armored fish. Uh, bony plates that line certainly the entire head, but sometimes the entire body. Here's a wonderful example of a chondrichthian hammerhead shark. Here's a shark egg. These are pretty neat. You can see these at most aquaria, where they'll actually have lights behind these and allow you to see these eggs at different points in development. Yep. All right. We'll keep going through these uh, pictures uh, on Wednesday, but we are out of time today. Enjoy the rest of your Monday. I don't know if I already said this, but happy Monday if I didn't already say it. If I did, you can have a second one. Happy Monday.